Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, our lecture series on um, the political history of modern Japan. Uh, and in the last uh, talk, I looked at a time uh, during the Taisho period, the 1920s in Japan, uh, the tumultuous 20s, and we looked at a number of things, uh, including uh, labor relations, um, mass popular uh, protests, <clears throat> and the structure of government at that time, <clears throat> which is regarded as a, a high point of um, the political parties and their activity uh, in pre-war Japan. And carrying on from that talk today, uh, I'm going to, to look at uh, the wartime uh, period in Japan, uh, especially from 1931 to 1945, uh, the Asia-Pacific War. Um, and I'm going to uh, especially focus on the structure of politics at that time, uh, as well as uh, look at the economy. Uh, and of course, I'll give a general <coughs> rundown as well of some of the major events of uh, the Asia-Pacific War. And actually, I'll, I'll start with that first. Um, one of the things I'm not going to touch on so much in this talk is uh, this kind of social history of wartime Japan. So I won't look at today too much how um, at popular representations of war, for instance. Um, there are a lot of good studies about that out there. Um, uh, I have many to recommend, perhaps in another talk. Um, but today, since we're looking at the political history, especially of modern Japan, I'm just mainly going to focus on that. And in the process, actually, um, I'm drawing from a number of books. Uh, one is Nakamura Takafusa's uh, Lectures on Modern Japanese Economic History. Great book. Um, <clears throat> another is a standard that I uh, always go back to, James McLean's A Modern History, Japan, or Japan A Modern History. And then this one, uh, which I recently got a hold of, um, it's a translation of um, political scholar uh, Kitaoka Shinichi's uh, work in English translation of his work. It just came out, I think, in the last few years, probably. Um, so I'll be drawing from these uh, books, especially uh, in this talk. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's get started. And... The title of my talk is uh, Origins and Outcomes of the Asia-Pacific War, 1931 to 1945. I want to start by looking at uh, Japanese imperialism and the history of uh, Western colonialism in Asia as well. So the historical context for this, <coughs> one context could be European uh, imperialism in Asia, and at the time, throughout the 19th century, European powers are coming in and uh, colonizing and taking over um, weaker uh, states in Asia and exploiting them for their uh, resources, <coughs> both uh, you know material resources and labor. Um, and this leads to the Anglo-Burmese War, the Java War, the First Opium War, Second Opium War, French takeover of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, the Second Anglo-Burmese War, and Burma then becoming a British protectorate, Thailand accepting unequal treaties, and opening to European trade. So in this context, then, uh, U.S. Navy Commodore Matthew Perry comes to Japan, <laughs> and the Tokugawa Bakufu is, you know, it knows what's going on around the world. <laughs> it sees this, it's concerned, it wants to make sure it doesn't fall prey to um, Western 
imperialism and economic penetration. Um, so it's Matthew Perry and the United States force, uh, forced unequal treaties on Japan in 1854, but this also precipitated a uh, civil war within Japan where reform-minded Japanese elites uh, toppled the centuries-old feudal Tokugawa Bakufu and replaced it with a modern nation-state. <laughs> and this is called the Meiji Ishin. And their aim was to adopt Western tech Technology and industry uh, under the slogans of, for instance, Fukoku Kyohei, uh, Shokusan Kogyo, uh, which, and make Japan a strong state that could uh, rival the major Western powers. So it began on this process of basically eventually imitating Western colonial powers by uh, solidifying and fortifying its boundaries and its territory. So it did this, for instance, already in 1855, before the Meiji Ishin, uh, Ezochi had been made Japanese territory. In 1869, uh, the year after uh, the Boshin War, Civil War, uh, it was renamed Hokkaido. In 1974, the Japanese government dispatched troops on the Taiwan expedition, so sent troops to Taiwan. Uh, dates are a bit backwards here, but in 1873, Saigo Takamori and others argued uh, that Japan should send troops to Korea as well. Um, this was the so-called Seikan-don. In 1876, uh, Japan did force unequal treaty, uh, an unequal treaty on Korea, the Treaty of uh, Kanghua. In 1879, uh, the Japanese government abolished the independent Ryukyu Kingdom and annexed Okinawa, or annexed uh, what was still Ryukyu Kingdom then, and, and established Okinawa Prefecture. This was known as the Ryukyu Shobun. And in 1850, 1885, uh, Fukuzawa Yukichi penned his uh, essay on saying goodbye to Asia, Datsu Adon. And I'll, I'll read a short um a segment from Fukuzawa Yukichi's uh, essay, which was published in his newspaper uh, anonymously, but it's usually attributed to him. Uh, the newspaper was the uh, Jiji Shinpo. And this just gives a sense of, um, you know, what, what prominent intellectuals were thinking at the time and, and a little bit of the uh, sociocultural climate um, in regards to uh, imperialism and colonialism. So he wrote, the Chinese and Koreans are more like each other and together they do not show as much similarity to the Japanese. These two peoples do not know how to progress either personally or as a nation. In my view, these two countries cannot survive as independent nations with the onslaught of Western civilization to the East. We do not have time to wait for the enlightenment of our neighbors so that we can work together toward the development of Asia. It is better for us to leave the ranks of Asian nations and cast our lot with civilized nations of the West. We simply erase from our minds our bad friends in Asia. Um, Fukuzawa Yukichi, and it kind of illustrates some of the thinking of prominent um, public intellectuals at the time. Um, Okay, and then in this context, Japan fought a war with uh, Qing China um, over Korea, and this was the 1894 to 95 Sino-Japanese War. Um, and I mentioned a little bit, looking at Fukuzawa Yukiji's quote, you know, what some prominent public intellectuals were thinking. Well, it was the same, basically, in government between some hardliners and um, who were pushing Japanese expansion <clears throat> to a greater extent. And that the general idea was that, you know, uh, Japan, most people in the, in the government at the time and politicians uh, agreed, you know, that um, on the idea of making Japan into a strong state and even, um, you know, there are very few critics amongst the elites of uh, Japanese empire uh, per se. It was more... A question of you know how fast do we want to progress with this basically well 
As an example of this, uh, Prime Minister Yamagata Aritomo uh, said that to prote protect Japan's uh, independence, that they needed not only to secure a line of sovereignty, but also a line of interest, and that this then extended beyond national borders and would include um, you know, colonies as well that would be within Japan's. It's, it's kind of like the idea of Western powers at the time of, of creating these spheres of, in, of influence or spheres of interest, right? And in 1894, um, Korean peasants revolted against the Korean monarchy uh, and the Japanese influence and Japanese influence in the court, and this was the Donghak Rebellion. Uh, the Korean emperor then appealed to uh, China for help, and China sent troops um, to quell this rebellion. But this worried uh, some Japanese leaders that uh, the Qing government was was now trying to kind of expand its power in Korea. So. Um, it, so Japan dispatched troops as well, and then this served as uh, the kind of spark that ignited uh, the war between these two powers. And major battles were fought, um, you know, in Korea and um, into parts of neighboring China, major battles at Pyongyang and the Yalu River. Um, but the, the modern, the Japanese army was much more uh, had had modernized much more quickly than um, the Chinese army, and it was able to uh, rather easily defeat uh, the Chinese army. So only around 1,400 Japanese were killed in this conflict, uh, as opposed to uh, 60,000 Chinese civilians and soldiers. And Japanese troops also <clears throat> uh, massacred civilians uh, at... Port Arthur, uh, when they occupied that city. Uh, in Japanese, Port Arthur, this is, well, the English name, of course. Um, the Japanese uh, name for Port Arthur is Ryojun, and Chinese, Lushun. Um, the Sino-Japanese War was very popular in Japan, and it caused this huge wave of popular patriotism. So people really from this time began to think that, you know, now Japan is strong. It can it's, it's up there with one of the Western powers, and it's defeated uh, China, for whom centuries Japan has had this, um, you know, the relationship has been the other way around, uh, where, where um, you know, China was really uh, the center of, of kind of <laughs> the universe, I guess, in, in a way, in, in one line of thinking. It was, it was the center of um, power. In Asia, and now that uh, that that balance of power had uh, shifted in Japan's favor. Um, throughout the war, as well, though, um, Koreans themselves were pushing for uh, independence and trying to achieve their own independence and trying to modernize the country and and overthrow uh, the feudal aristocracy. <laughs> as well as, at the same time, fight against uh, foreign influence, including by Japan. And so Korean resistance, led by uh, Jong Bong-gun, uh, attacked Japanese forces in Korea and sabotaged, tried to sabotage Japanese rule. Um, and actually, in the Sino-Japanese War, even though it was a conflict between China and Japan, it was about, uh, it was over control in Korea. <clears throat> and over 30,000 people were killed at this time in Korea in crackdowns and massacres uh, against this resistance and independence movement. Well, um, the overall number of victims is estimated uh, between 300 to 400,000. Um, meanwhile, Koreans launched the Gabo reforms, uh, abolishing the class system, and implemented a new tax system, but um, Japan is basically then trying to counter these efforts and to make Korea a protectorate. So uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Inoue Kaoru, uh, after he became uh, the Japanese minister to Korea, he brought back uh, Queen Min and the royal and royal control, and he hired uh, Japanese advisors to the court. So Japan kind of, you know, 
um, gave back power to uh, the court and then tried to work through the court uh, to implement its reforms and to implement greater Japanese control while simultaneously um, quashing <coughs> any internal independence movements. Now, <coughs> these are all, these images uh, that I'm going to show are from MIT uh, Visualizing Cultures database. And at that database, they have uh, an amazing, it's an amazing resource. They have a lot of these woodblock prints of the Sino-Japanese War done by Japanese artists, which uh, depict the fighting. And it's important to know that these are all based on basically hearsay, essentially, that artists would hear accounts of the war, many times probably glorified, and then kind of add their own artistic flair to uh, portray these. So it really reflects, rather than an accurate portrayal of the battle. It reflects instead um, how Japanese artists wanted to perceive Japan at that time and China and how they wanted to perceive the Japanese and Chinese armies. And what we see, what emerges um, from those depictions is an image of uh, the Japanese, of Japanese soldiers as being very modern, as wearing these you know, modern Western military uniforms and this contrasts greatly with uh, the Chinese army, <laughs> who's dressed still in uh, more traditional forms of clothing. Also, the weaponry is totally different. Japanese soldiers are depicted as having modern weapons and bayonets. The Chinese are fighting with swords. Um, and then finally, the Japanese as well, in, in addition to being depicted, of course, as the righteous victors, uh, in this battle are shown as being very strong while the Chinese forces, on the other hand, are uh, painted as being very weak. And here they're just being toppled into the water off this bridge or fleeing, uh, <laughs> something like that. And here's another image that um, kind of metaphorically depicts uh, how Japan perceived its... Um, mission at the time, essentially. And so here we see a Japanese soldier, um, uh, Higuchi, Commander uh, Higuchi, who is uh, carrying a child, it seems, in the midst of this battle with bullets flying and whizzing around him. And, of course, a scene like this is not something that one would encounter on an actual battlefield. So what this, so we know then that this is symbolic um, and it's metaphorical for something. And what is it metaphorical for? Well, it's a, it's a, a metaphor for uh, Japan saving Korea, basically. <laughs> Korea depicted uh, as a child in this picture who needs its uh, adult protector, who will then come and save it from uh, the Qing government, from China, and chase these Chinese troops away. And that's what's being depicted in this image. Um, in the aftermath of this war, so the war was settled with the 1895 Treaty of Shimonoseki, uh, and at that time China ceded the Liaodong Peninsula, as well as Taiwan, also all of Taiwan to uh, Japan, and it also opened up ports to uh, Japanese uh, companies and merchants for trade and for them to establish businesses there. Um, however, uh, Russia, Germany, and France were concerned about uh, Japan, you know, infringing on their uh, special rights and interests in uh, China, and so they made Japan return the Liaodong Peninsula. Um, fighting, though, actually continued for another five months uh, in Taiwan. And Taiwan did uh, didn't just submit uh, willingly to Japanese rule. Uh, members of the Chinese aristocracy, <laughs> uh, as well as native inhabitants of Taiwan, opposed Japanese rule. Uh, and so Japan sent 49,835 soldiers um, to Taiwan and uh, suffered 
4,642 losses, including notably Prince Kitashidakawa. Um, well, the total number of Taiwanese killed was well over 10,000. And as I mentioned, there was this continued fighting and pushback against a Japanese rule throughout. Uh, China also had to pay a huge indemnity, which was equal to three years of its national income. So there was no way that the Qing government could uh, pay this. It had just lost a war and now has to pay um, this huge amount of money to Japan. So it borrowed most of that money from the West. And then Western countries would uh, use these loans as kind of bargaining chips to extract more rights and concessions in China. And meanwhile, Japan was able then to use that national income, or uh, sorry, that uh, indemnity, the money it received from China, to enlarge its own military. Um, and then also as a result of uh, Qing defeat in that war, uh, Western powers began to uh, demand more concessions from China, as I mentioned, while the U.S. insisted on its open-door policy requesting free trade from the Western powers in their various spheres of influence. And then the next major um, conflict was the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War just 10 years later. So as I mentioned, the Sino-Japanese War was fought mainly over control in Korea. Um, but Russia as well at this time is trying to expand its control in northern China, Mongolia and northern China, what would later become Manchuria, uh, and, well, in parts of Manchuria, what would later become Manchukuo, I mean. <laughs> um, and it, it was began, this kind of brought then and this is right on, on the border of Japan's sphere of influence, what's, what it sees as its sphere of influence in Korea. And so this started to bring Japan and Russia into conflict with each other. And Russia began to take a more assertive stance from 1902, especially when it demanded that um, Japan remove uh, its troops from Korea and pull out of Korea. Um, meanwhile, Russian expa uh, southern expansion threatened Great Britain's interests in China as well. And Great Britain was busy fighting the Boer War at this time and grabbing territory in Africa. Um, so it, it didn't really have time to focus all of its energies on Russia in Asia. And so partly to counter that then, it signed uh, the 1902 Anglo-Japanese Alliance uh, with Japan. Um, and then the following year, Russia, Russia refused to withdraw troops from Manchuria, um, <clears throat> even after it had promised to do so to the Qing government. Um, well, diplomatic talks then started to break down between Russia and China in 1904, and Japan eventually attacked uh, Russia at Incheon uh, and Lushun. And the war continued until August 1905. Um, this was a much larger scale war than the Sino-Japanese War. Russia was a modern Western power. Um, so Japan was going up against kind of new, a new kind of opponent here. And it really had to mobilize all of its resources and even uh, had to fund a lot of the war through foreign borrowing um, and loans. And even in terms of labor as well, it <laughs> relied on the use of forced Korean labor. Um, but both sides also uh, used forced labor in China, and over 100,000 Chinese were killed because this, these battles were fought on, uh, you know, in northern China, right? Not in, in Russia or Japan. And over 100,000 th 100, Chinese were killed, even though the country was neutral in this conflict. Um, Japan mobilized, meanwhile, uh, over 1 million uh, troops, suffering 84,000 war deaths and 381,000 wounded, while spending 1.8 billion, uh, most of which was acquired through borrowing, as I mentioned. Now, the aftermath of this as well, this war as well, becomes important late for um, you know, ongoing uh, Japanese uh, colonialism in Asia which eventually starts to sow the seeds of a much larger conflict with uh, China uh, first and then with 
Western powers, uh, the United States and Great Britain later, leading us into the Asia-Pacific War. So this is why I really want to start by touching on these things first. And the 1905 Portsmouth Treaty, which settled the war between Japan and Russia, um, in this treaty, Russia recognized Japan's special rights in Korea. And uh, <clears throat> also Japan gained the Liaodong Peninsula and Port Arthur. Um, so it got back a lot of this territory it had lost in the Liaodong Peninsula uh, after the triple intervention uh, in the previous Sino-Japanese War. And then Japan also gained Russian railway rights in South Manchuria. In 1905, Ito Hirobumi pressured uh, Emperor Gojong uh, to make Korea a protectorate of Japan, and the Japanese established the governor general in Korea, which handled government affairs. In 1906, Japan established the Kwantung government, Kanto Totokufu, which controlled South Manchuria, and it set up the South Manchuria Railway Company, uh, whose aim was the economic exploitation of the region's resources. Now, the South Manchuria Railway Company controlled, it wasn't just a railway company, it was a whole conglomerate of companies as well, at, and it had administrative rights as well to uh, administer the territories surrounding the railroad, so it ran and operated schools, businesses, hotels, um, public services, water, um, you know, water supply, you name it, and all of these things fell under the control of the South Manchurian Railway Company. So it was really kind of at the same time, you know, as a tool for exploiting the economic resources of Manchuria, it was also kind of a cover for, um, you know, covert Japanese rule. Uh, but Japanese anti-Japanese resistance, meanwhile, was growing in Korea, and An Jung-gun uh, assassinated Ito Hidobumi, and then after this, Korea annexed, uh, or Japan annexed Korea, as a colony in 1910. Um, in World War, so I'll touch on some of the issues of World War One. We looked at this a little bit in the past lecture, but Japan basically uses World War One as an opportunity, uh, you know, through its alliance with Great Britain to seize German possessions in China, um, and then it started to issue more demands to the Qing government as well to increase its influence within China. Um, during the war, Sun Yat-sen established the Guomindang, a nationalist government in Guangzhou, uh, and also then uh, in Russia, and the Bolsheviks uh, <coughs> under Lenin had uh, launched the Russian Revolution and overthrown the feudal government there uh, and began to establish a socialist government uh, in Russia. They also called for a uh, declaration of peace and an end to World War I. Um, then after this, Japan sent troops to Russia, which again, as we've seen, it has this tenuous relationship with because their, um, their imperialist expansionist uh, policies are coming up against each other, bumping into each other in northern China and Manchuria. Um, which is now nominally, you know, kind of, it's tenu it's under Japanese control, but it's, it's, it's kind of tenuous, and Japan wants to protect this. Manchuria, at the time as well, is serving as a kind of a buffer zone, too, um, for, for Japanese uh, rule in Korea. So, um, using this Russian Revolution as an excuse, and, and, and you know, also saying it wants to help, you know, um, put down the communists, basically overthrow the communists. It sends 70,000 troops uh, on the Siberian intervention against the R uh, Russian Red Army, along with other Western powers. Well, in Europe then, concluding World War II, the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 established the Versailles system and the League of Nations, um, and it encouraged the idea of self-determination um, for nations. So but this didn't really mean independence from colonialism. Um, nevertheless, it encouraged these independence movements in China and Korea. Uh, and in Korea, for instance, two million people um, protested uh, and uh, you know, uh, were seeking uh, independence from Japanese rule. Well, um, Japan quickly and brutally cracked down on this. 
Um, and this brought a lot of popular discontent. And um, then Japan had to shift its policy from a more military policy of military rule to cultural rule in China, uh, sorry, in Korea. Um, meanwhile, in Europe, uh, the Western powers are trying earnestly to enact uh, legal measures and other treaties uh, that will uh, reduce um, the ability to uh, go to war anytime in the immediate future. And so in 1921, the Washington Naval Treaty, for instance, reduced the size of uh, Japanese, U.S., Great Britain, and French uh, navies, um, partly out of austerity measures and partly to limit Japanese expansion. Well, the 1922 Kellogg-Bryan Pact uh, attempted to limit war and to resolve resolve disputes diplomatically and peacefully. <clears throat> but, uh, of course, unfortunately, these measures uh, did not hold. And in China, uh, the Japanese were, uh, Japan was absolutely determined to quash the nascent nationalist movement there and to maintain its spheres of influence at first, which then it gradually expands to the idea of uh, just outright direct control and military domination. So in 1928, the Kwantung army uh, assassinated the Manchurian warlord Zhang uh, uh, Shaolin Ling and his son Zhang uh, Shaoling. Oh, sorry, his son uh, Zhang. Uh, sorry, this is a mistake. Um, but uh, Zhang Shaoling uh, allied himself with uh, uh, the nationalists, the, the Guomindang, um, and uh, he opposed the Japanese occupation and started building a new railway par running parallel to the South Manchurian Railway. So this is a direct challenge to uh, Japanese economic uh, domination in Manchuria. Um, so then from this time, Ishiwara Kanji and uh, Itagaki Seishido uh, began to draw plans to get full control of Manchuria. Um, <laughs> Ishihara was a, uh, a military officer uh, in the Japanese army. Um, in the background of this, then, the following year is the 1929 Great Depression, uh, wherein global trade plummeted uh, 65%. So this is a huge shock to national economies around the world. Um, and Japanese expansion, then, this just kind of motivates Japanese expansion as a way Japanese leaders think to alleviate these economic pressures and to revive the Japanese economy. Um, so in 1931, um, Ishiwara and others from the Kwantung army um, blew up part of the South Manchurian railway uh, track outside of Mukden, uh, Hoten in Japanese or Shenyang today. Um, this is known as the Manchurian incident. And this caused the uh, cabinet of Prime Minister Wakatsuki Reijido to resign since they were unable to get the military under its control and had, and kind of lost control of the military at this time. Well, a new cabinet formed under Inukai Tsuyoshi, which was more supportive of military policy. And eventually even the emperor issued a decree to the Kwantung army praising their actions. So in this climate, then encouraging climate, <laughs> Within four months, uh, the army controlled 1.1 million square kilometers of territory in Manchuria, and this is three times the total landmass of Japan. So it's a, a huge amount of territory. Um, in response, in 1932, the League of Nations sent the Lytton Commission to Manchuria to investigate uh, the investigate the cause of this conflict and. Um, the, uh, uh, the damaging of the South Manchuria Railroad um, because the, the Kwantung Army had used this as an excuse. It had blamed it on the Chinese Army and used it as an excuse to um, <laughs> attack the Chinese Army there. Um, well, the commission report was not very favorable to Japan. Uh, it saw through this uh, manufactured attempt uh, by the Kwantung Army and 
stated that the Japanese army had engineered the Manchurian incident, and also that Japan was illegally occupying Manchuria, and that Manch Manchukuo, which um, uh, the Kwantung army had, had established as the new state, uh, was in fact a puppet state controlled by Japan. Um, and when the General Assembly of the League of Nations accepted this report, uh, this, of course, was, uh, you know, Japanese leaders were not very happy about this. And the Jap uh, Japan's representative, Matsuoka Yosuke, walked out of these proceedings. And shortly thereafter, the Japanese emperor issued a decree withdrawing from the League of Nations. Um, as I mentioned, the Kwantung army established Manchukuo, uh, this state or puppet state with its capital at Changchun in Japanese called Shinkyo. They made Puyi, uh, the last emperor of the Qing dynasty, the new head of the Manchukuo state. <clears throat> and then uh, after this thing, Japan gradually starts to um, give much more power to its military, to build up militarily and then at the same time um, kind of withdraw or go back on a lot of these treaties that it had signed with Western powers in order to limit uh, military capacities. So in 1935, 1936, Japan withdrew from the Five Power Treaty and the London Naval Treaty. Um, the U.S. Uh, then adopted a policy of containment against Japan, but um, Japan was continuing to expand uh, beyond Manchuria into Jehol province, and it wanted to establish uh, North China as well as a buffer zone, now a buffer zone for Manchuria. Manchuria, the official excuse for being there was it's, one of them was it's a uh, buffer zone for Korea. Now they need a buffer zone for Manchuria. So this is how the logic of expansionism works in foreign uh, policy. Um, Eventually, Japan created a puppet government in five provinces in North China under uh, Yinju Keng. And in 1936, Japan uh, also then started to adopt a more hostile foreign policy toward the U.S. and Great Britain and ally itself closer with Germany and Italy. It, sign it signed the anti comintern Pact uh, directed against global communism, thus officially joining it with the fascist Axis camp. Um, and meanwhile, in uh, China, the CCP under Zhou Enlai had negotiated a settlement between uh, the communists and the nationalists to form a joint alliance uh, and fight against Japan. Okay, and at the same time, within Japan in 1936, a young army officers with the Imperial Way faction, the Kodoha, uh, launched a coup. And during the course of this coup, they took over many parts of Tokyo, uh, attacked uh, prominent politicians who favored closer relationships with uh, the U.S. and Great Britain, uh, and were perhaps leaning toward a more um, or a less expansionist policy in China. Uh, Prime Minister Okada, the Finance Minister Takashi Korekio, Lord Keeper Privy of the Seal, uh, Saito Makoto, Grand Chamberlain Suzuki Kantaro, uh, and others. And uh, eventually this coup failed. And there, there was infighting uh, within the, the military at this time. So this was one faction of the military. Um, the other faction was the control faction. Um, and with whom Tojo Hideki, who would later become prime minister, was aligned. Um, so this didn't really necessarily have everyone on board. Um, and perhaps because of that, the, the emperor eventually denounced this and basically, you know, this uh, eliminated the possibility of this coup to succeed. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, uh, in the the Japanese military, you know, continued to its policy of provocation uh, in China. And in 1937, uh, the Marco Polo Bridge incident outside Beijing then uh, was the spark that, that uh, ignited this larger conflict, full-scale war between Japan and China. It's not clear 
uh, who fired the first shot. Uh, but nevertheless, um, shots were fired and uh, uh, then fighting between Japanese and Chinese forces uh, occurred here. Prime Minister Konoe Fumimoto uh, then, you know, quickly moved um, to up the ante by sending more troops to China um, and then fighting uh, breaks out uh, starting with the Battle of Shanghai. Um, Japanese planes also begin to bomb Hangzhou, Guangde, uh, and Nanjing. And this uh, indiscriminate bombing by uh, Japanese Navy planes at this time was uh, in breach of the Hague Peace Conference of 1907, which both Japan and China had ratified. Um, but Japan continued to bomb Nanjing until its fall uh, in December of 1937, and indiscriminately bombed 60-plus other Chinese towns, including Shanghai, Hankou, Hangzhou, and Guangzhou. Uh, this attracted huge criticism from <coughs> the international community, um, especially since this was, as I mentioned, indiscriminate civilian bombing, and there had been no official declaration of war yet. Uh, the Battle of Shanghai lasted for three months. Uh, it was a, a very large uh, conflict between 700,000 Chinese troops and 300,000 Japanese troops. Um, the League of Nations uh, condemned uh, Japan at this time, but um, European nations now were, uh, they had other things to think about. Um, namely, they were occupied with the rise of the Nazis. Uh, and fighting the Nazis in Europe, and thus took a more passive stance uh, in Asia. In December 1937, uh, the Japanese army captured Nanjing, and then <clears throat> subsequently um, there unfolded uh, six weeks of rape and slaughter, which today is known as the uh, Nanking Massacre. Um, the Tokyo trials, which were held after the war by Allied powers uh, to uh, pursue Japanese war responsibility, um, estimated that there were uh, 20,000 rape cases in the first month of the occupation of Nan Nanjing, and in the first six weeks of the occupation, over 200,000 Chinese civilians were uh, massacred, uh, civilians and POWs were massacred. Um, a subsequent war crimes tribunal in Nanjing later estimated that 300,000 were killed. Um, Meanwhile, though, this did not break uh, Chinese nationalist defenses in any way. Uh, the Guomindang instead moved to Chongqing, um, where it continued to uh, uh, fight the war against Japan, um, and, and Japanese planes then uh, launched bombing raids against Chongqing as well. Um, Kono, Prime Minister Konoe at this time issued the first Konoe Declaration in January 1938, announcing non-cooperation with uh, Chiang Kai-shek's government. Um, and the war continued. In April 1938, there was another large battle at Wuhan, which involved 300,000 Japanese troops uh, against one million Chinese troops, uh, and it lasted four and a half months. The Japanese eventually captured the city, but they still couldn't destroy Chinese forces. Um, and it, also in the Battle of Wuhan, Japan used chemical weapons during the fighting in violation of international law, firing poisonous gases over 375 times and firing 40,000 plus poison gas shells. Um, later in, in the same year then, in 1937-1938, Konoe enacted the National Mobilization Law, announced the Declaration of New Order in East Asia, um, and uh, I'll talk more about that later. But basically, um, from this time then, during the war with China, um, this leads Japan into conflict with the United States and Great Britain especially, um, partly because the U.S. and Great Britain um, are sending loans uh, to China, to Chiang Kai-shek, uh, to fight against um, uh, Japan, which he's using then to fight against Japan. Um, well, Russia as well uh, is supporting China at this time because it doesn't want uh, it. It doesn't want to fight Japan itself, even though um, 
you know, they have conflicting interests, as I've already shown in northern China. Um, these are some quotes from military officers and commanders detailing the uh, Nanking Massacre. Um, there are, there's a wealth of documentary evidence um, written by uh, first-hand uh, observers of um, the atrocities that took place there. Um, but I think, and many of those are quite, uh, well, um, very, you know, detailed. Uh, they're very good source materials for understanding that. Um, but I like to turn especially just to um, the words of Japanese soldiers and commanders themselves, because I think they offer one of um, the clearest um, evidences of atrocities that happened there. Um, so a military field diary of the 22nd Regiment wrote on December 14th, 1937, a simple, the entry was simply executed 328 POWs by firing squad and buried the bodies. And POWs here, by the way, means anyone captured by the Japanese army who was in any way suspected of cooperating or aiding with, aiding the Chinese army or harboring anti-Japanese sentiments. So this was men, women, elderly. Uh, it, it could have been anybody. And, and the excuse was at the time... Uh, that Chinese soldiers, uh, Japan said that Chinese soldiers had taken off their military uniforms and adopted civilian clothing, so that then Japan Japanese uh, soldiers would go around and round up everybody basically and try to, you know, determine who was actually helping uh, or fighting with the Chinese army when there was really no way of determining uh, this in many cases. <laughs> So um, POWs here is, should be used, it's used very broadly, it doesn't just refer to captured soldiers in this case. It uh, refers to anybody who was captured as prisoner uh, by the Japanese army. Uh, Azuma Shido, a former 22nd Regiment soldier, wrote in his diary, whenever we soldiers found a young Chinese woman, we would always peek at her private parts. Some sh soldiers would also rape women. The truly awful ones would kill the women after raping them for fear of having their crime reported. And perhaps most damningly, uh, General Nakajima Kesago, the operational commander for the Battle of Nanking, wrote, uh, as a general rule, we are not taking POWs. When the numbers are in the tens of thousands, it's impossible to fully disarm all of them. Digging a mass grave for even seven to 8,000 is nevertheless a massive undertaking. Thus, the plan is to execute the POWs in groups of one or 200. So, again, as you can see here, people were rounded up, labeled POWs, and then the POWs were executed in numbers of hundreds, uh, groups of hundreds. So this is how this basically played out. Um, I want to look at some other documents from the time, and, and this actually does touch on uh, kind of more of a social history of the time in a way, because um, this is these are documents more, well, definitely directed toward the Japanese populace at home. And both of these were issued by the Ministry of Education, um, so they were especially uh, written with students in mind. Uh, and... Uh, massive amounts of copies of them were distributed uh, to people uh, through schools around the country. And the first document is, its English name is Fundamentals of Our National Polity, in Japanese, Kokutai no Hongi. And this was issued by the MOE in 1937. And it stated in part, um, sorry, whoops, <laughs> kind of a long document, so um, just had to, you know, pick up bits and pieces here, but our country is established with the emperor, who is a descendant of Amaterasu Omikami, as its center, as our ancestors as well as we ourselves constantly have beheld in the emperor the fountainhead of her life and activities. For this reason, to serve the emperor and to receive the emperor's great august will as our own is the rationale of making our historical life live in the present. And on this is based the morality of the people. The true characteristics of filial piety in our country are its perfect conformity with our great national polity 
by heightening still further the relationship between morality and nature. Our country is a great family nation, and the imperial household is the, the head family of the, sub, of the subjects and the nucleus of national life. So, actually, to be honest, this document, much of it, um, it, it sounds just like gobbledygook, basically. Like, it, it doesn't make much sense. Um, it basically tries to posit, uh, to blame all of the contemporary evils, quote, evils in Japan on foreign ideologies like liberalism, socialism, and communism. And it says Japan and Japanese people need to reject these. And in place of them, what the Japanese people should do instead is um, find pride in being a Japanese and having this superior lineage and ideology of the emperor-centered ideology which posits uh, Japanese subjects as descendants of the emperor, who himself is supposedly descendants of a descendant of the gods of Amaterasu Omikami. So it's this it's this kind of self-reaffirming uh, ideology of racial superiority that also justifies <coughs> imperial expansion uh, and colonization of uh, Asian peoples and the rule by the Japanese. And at the same time, it encourages Japanese people to basically just give everything they have to the emperor uh, and to the nation state. And um, to and it's it's kind of designed the document as this um, ideological uh, mobilization to to get people uh, behind the war effort and state goals. And similar document was released in 1941, uh, The Way of the Subjects, Shinmin no Michi, also by the Ministry of Education. And I'll read a, a little passage from this. Um, this one actually makes a little bit more sense. I mean, just in terms of how it's written, like uh, it's a little bit more legible, more comprehensible. Um, and it reads, in part, uh, Japan has come to be keenly conscious of the fact that the stabilization of East Asia is her mission, and that the emancipation of East Asian nations rests solely on her efforts. The cardinal objective of strengthening the total war organism is solely to help the imperial throne, and this can be attained by all the people fulfilling their duty as subjects through their respective positions in society. The ideals of Japan are to manifest to the entire world the spirit of her empire founding. There is virtually no country in the world other than Japan having such a superb and lofty mission bearing world significance. The great duty of the Japanese people is to guard and maintain the imperial throne, um, I guess there should be a witch here, which has lasted to the present, and will last forever and ever. To serve the emperor is its key point. Our lives will become sincere and true when they are offered to the emperor and the state. Our own private life is fulfillment of the way of the subjects. In other words, it is not private, but public, insofar as it is held by the subjects supporting the throne. <laughs> so Japan's got this great colonizing mission in East Asia, um, and it should be led you know, by the Japanese people who simultaneously are just totally submissive uh, to the government and willing to offer their lives um, to, to die for the imperial state, right? This is what it's basically saying, okay? Um, okay, continuing on with the war then. Um, in 1938-1939, there are conflicts between Russia <clears throat> with Russia at the Manchurian border with heavy Japanese losses. So, um, and then also at the same time, the USSR has signed a non-aggression pact with Germany, and Hitler. this allowed Hitler then to invade Poland in September 1939, uh, and World War II then began. Japanese control in Korea, meanwhile, had intensified. Koreans had to swear loyalty to the Japanese emperor. They were forced to worship at Japanese shrines, adopt Japanese names. Um, the Korean language was forbidden in schools and public places. Uh, and forced nationalization meant that Koreans had to contribute everything to the war, including uh, uh, labor and uh, women for sex services, uh, later known as, uh, or euphemistically known, even at the time, 
as Ianfu or comfort women. Um, <clears throat> the Korean resistance movement continued. Uh, Kim Il Sung, um, later uh, first leader of North Korea, uh, led the anti Japanese resistance movement in Manchuria, the anti Japanese United Army. There were other anti Japanese pro independence Korean groups as well who cooperated and fought alongside the Chinese army. Uh, the Provisional Government of the Republic of Korea was established in Shanghai in 1919, and it moved to Chongqing in 1940 and formed the Korean Liberation Army. Uh, in 1940, Japan recruited defector, <clears throat> a defector from the Guomindang Wang Jingwei and made him head of the puppet government in Nanjing, which opposed uh, the Guomindang in Chongqing. Uh, in 1940, September 1940, Japan invaded French Indochina, and signed the tripartite pact with Germany and Italy. Uh, the U.S. meanwhile issued a total ban of scrap iron to Japan, and in China, uh, Japan uh, Japanese control in China uh, was always very tenuous. It was fighting um, the Chinese army, the Communists, and the Guomindang uh, as well, and trying to uh, rule through military force. Uh, against a very hostile public who is uh, seeking its own independence. Um, and so it, it adopted an increasingly hostile policy and brutal policy of attacking civilians and burning down villages where the Eighth Army, the Communist Eighth Army, frequently stayed, especially. This was part of the three all strategies, uh, strategy, uh, Sanko Sakusen, burn all, kill all, or loot all. And as I mentioned earlier, they indiscriminately bombed uh, Chongqing between in 1939 and 1941. <laughs> in July 1940, the Imperial Headquarters adopted a policy of also carrying the war south. Um, it saw the fighting in Europe as an opportunity to take more territory and colonies from the West and to make up for resources which it was sorely lacking from, um, partly due to trade embargoes and placed on it by the US. Um, and it also saw this as a way to cut off supply routes to China through the Burma Road. Uh, China was getting support from outside Western nations, as I mentioned, and this was allowing it partly to carry on the war against Japan, so it, it wanted to cut this off as well. So you can see already how Japan's policy in China has brought it squarely into conflict with the U.S. and Great Britain especially. I'm not, uh, <laughs> Matsuoka Yosuke concluded a neutrality treaty with Russia so he could focus on the southern advance in the spring of 1941. Um, meanwhile, the U.S. was involved in the war, the European war, and wanted to avoid war with Japan. Um, but Matsuoka later argued uh, for Germany and Italy to break the neutrality pact that he had just signed with Russia. So, again, this is just a strategic thing, um, you know, and never had any real intent here of forming an actual, um, you know, peaceful solution with Russia. Um, in July, Japan invaded southern French Indochina. In response, the U.S. placed a total ban of oil to Japan and freezed uh, all Japanese assets uh, in its foreign accounts. Um, on, in August, uh, the U.S. and Great Britain issued the Atlantic Charter, which stated the aim of liberating people under access control, and Russia was added to the charter as well. A new cabinet in Japan led by Tojo Hideki, um, and was led by Tojo Hideki in, the, in an imperial conference in November, uh, decided to go to war basically with the U.S. and Great Britain. Um, they were unable to respond to uh, U.S. diplomatic calls for uh, Japan to with, withdraw from China at this point. Military leaders in control of the country had just felt that, um, you know, Japan had invested too much in China and it was unable, it felt, to withdraw from China and thus acquiesce to U.S. demands. Um, and the emperor gave his approval for the war with uh, the U.S. and Great Britain. And Japan attacked Pearl Harbor in December. Uh, the emperor then issued the imperial edict declaring war against the U.S. and Great Britain, and the following day, over 20 countries declared war on Japan. <laughs> Japan uh, tried to justify its uh, policies in the war in general 
which it called the Greater East Asian War as a holy war to, quote, liberate Asia from Western colonialism and build a Greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. <laughs> um, I'll talk a little bit more about forced labor later, but uh, the in 1939, the National Service Draft Ordinance um, forcefully recruited Koreans, mobilized Koreans, and brought them to work in key Japanese industries, uh, such as coal mines. Uh, and um, same happened in Taiwan as well. Um, and in, I'm going to skip over this a little bit, but basically... Um, the course of the war did not go as Japan had planned. Uh, from the 1943 Battle of Guadalcanal, then there was a real reversal from Japan's defeat there. There was a real reversal in the initial gains uh, that Japan had made, capturing Western colonies in the Philippines and elsewhere around the Pacific. And now uh, the tide of the war reversed also after the, the Battle of Midway. Um, and the U.S. especially then began a policy of kind of island hopping and, and gradually cut it, closing in on mainland Japan and cutting off its supply routes uh, to <coughs> its territories it had captured uh, abroad. In the U.S. Uh, in 1945, July, uh, sorry, in July 1944, the U.S. captured Saipan and the Mariana Islands, and it began launching air raids from uh, the Mariana Islands against the Japanese mainland. Uh, eventually, 67 major Japanese cities were bombed uh, indiscriminately to near total destruction. So men, women, children, elderly, uh, all made targets of U.S. bombs. Um, in March, on uh, March 10th, uh, over 300 U.S. Uh, B-29 bombers uh, for two hours uh, bombed uh, Tokyo, and uh, killing over 100,000 civilians uh, in a single night. Uh, in February 1945, the Alta Conference discussed the U.S. Uh, discussed Soviet entry into the war against Japan, and here the decision was made to transfer the Kur Isles to the USSR after the war. This starting uh, kind of territory dispute that lasts to this day. Uh, in May 1945, Germany surrendered. Uh, in July, at the 1945 Potsdam Conference, uh, the Allies called for the unconditional surrender of of Japan. But Prime Minister Suzuki Kantaro ignored this declaration. Uh, him ignoring it was called mokusatsu, just not issuing a reply, and it, it did not address, he felt, the issue of uh, how the imperial institution would be preserved, how the kokutai would be preserved. Um, Japan, Japanese leaders by this time certainly knew that they were going to lose the war. <laughs> they were just holding out uh, for what they felt would be more favorable surrender um, conditions. Um, between April and June 1945, during the Battle of Okinawa, over 200,000 or approximately 200,000 civilians, Japanese and U.S. soldiers were killed. The majority of these, over 100,000, were civilians. Uh, the U.S. dropped uh, atom two atomic bombs to secure its global hegemony in the post-war um, in Hiroshima, uh, killing... Uh, 140,000. In August 8th, the Soviets uh, entered the war against Japan and attacked Manchuria. And the following day, the U.S. dropped the second atomic bomb on Nagasaki, um, resulting in 70,000 deaths by the end of 1945. And Japanese leaders had been concerned about the preservation of the Kokutai, but after um, receiving uh, assurances that, <laughs> or, uh, uh, that probably the Kokutai would be preserved, uh, the, the emperor issued his uh, statement uh, uh, announcing the end of the war on August 15th. Okay, um, so that was a lot of information, uh, and I just had to basically go over all of that, though, because um, I wanted to give a general just outline of the major events that happened uh, during the Asia-Pacific War, and there was so much that happened, and actually I found it really difficult just to fully encompass uh, all of this history in, into a single PowerPoint lecture. And there's just so much events are moving so quickly at this time. Um, and, and I think this is really why you know, so many scholars focus in on this period and why so many books have been written about it, because there's so much to investigate still in the history of the Asia-Pacific War. But 
I, anyway, I tried to just go over some of the basic um, events that happened uh, to give everyone kind of a general understanding of what was going on in this time. And next, I'm going to talk about wartime politics and economy in a little bit more detail. So here are um, uh, the prime ministers um, who served uh, throughout then uh, basically the wartime period. Uh, Hiro Takoki, Hayashi Senjiro, Konoe Fumimaro, Hiranuma Keiichiro, Abe Nobuyuki, Yonai Mitsumasa, Konoe Fumimaro again, uh, three times total, and Tojo Hideki, Koiso Kuniaki, and Suzuki Kantaro. <laughs> so some of these names are going to come up a bit in the next few slides. Maybe just kind of keep them in mind uh, in the order that they serve. But definitely two to remember, uh, Konoe Fumimaro and Tojo Hideki. Uh, of the political structure at the time, so as I mentioned, in 1937 and 1938, a Prime Minister Konoe called for a new order movement. Oops. Uh, he drew from his earlier uh, work with the Showa Research Association and the writings of Ryo, uh, Ro, sorry, Royama Masamichi, uh, an academic at Tokyo University, who wanted to develop a fascist structure like Nazi Germany. Uh, Konoe and others formed the quasi-government political party, uh, the Imperial Assistance Association, Imperial Rule Assistance Association, IRAA, which was uh, supposed to replace the Diet. Uh, however, the IR IRAA never fully achieved its initial aims and was greatly reduced in scope. It became a compromise organization which accommodated its critics and political parties uh, and indeed, the Diet actually continued to operate throughout the war, holding regular meetings and performing its normal duties. Um, this is kind of interesting to think about, actually. So Japan never really fully developed its idea for a fascist or totalitarian state, per se. The government basically continued functioning how it was supposed to function. And I think what this indicates, then, is not a takeover, a military takeover of the government, but rather that... It points to um, problems in the fundamental structure of uh, the Meiji, of the founding of the modern Japanese nation state from the Meiji period. And that's why I tried to stress those things so much in the first lecture of the series in the foundation of the Meiji state. Um, <laughs> Prime Minister Tojo carried on the national mobilization policies, himself becoming the most powerful prime minister in Japanese history. But even in spite of this, he never fully gained control over the elites, the army, the bureaucracy, or the diet. And James McLean, historian James McLean wrote, uh, Fortunately for the prime minister, diet members were genuine patriots whose passionate speeches cens censoring the pernicious Anglo-American enemies echoed through the ornate halls of the chamber. Um, so what he's saying here basically is, um, you know, part of the reason why leaders like Tojo were successful in the first place was that their fundamental views uh, for Japanese policy were shared by um, a lot of the rest of the elites and elite politicians uh, as well. And moreover, most legislators joined the IR IRAA as a way of proving their patriotism and loyalty to the state. So McLean concluded that Tojo probably, probably wielded less power than Roosevelt or Churchill, let alone Hitler which is something else kind of interesting to think about. <laughs> um, turning now to the economy, uh, Ugaki, Kazushige, and Koiso Kuniake, uh, Ishiwara Kanji, etc., envisioned a new economic order proposing to develop Japan, uh, Japanese policies as a, quote, resource base, and also centralized government control over the economy. Uh, many people had become greatly disappointed with capitalism, uh, after the Great Depression. <clears throat> and economists like Arisawa Hiromi uh, argued for a state-planned economy instead to make a strong war state. Uh, Konoe then elevated uh, ideas like this to a national goal, um, adopting, for instance, in 1937, the Cabinet Planning Board, which nationalized um, electric power companies. In 1938, the Ministry of Health and Welfare was formed, and it introduced social welfare and health programs to improve people's lives. Healthy people equal strong soldiers. Uh, 
The Electric Power Industry Act also consolidated electric power companies into nine companies under the supervision of the Ministry of Communications. Some things I want to point out here are points of continuity between the post pre, uh, or wartime Japan and post-war Japan. The Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare continues to operate today. And uh, also um, the strong bonds between electric power companies and the basic monopolies that they hold in Japan the strong bonds between them and the Japanese government. Um, and also something interesting to think about is these social welfare programs that were adopted during the war uh, to focus on people's health. Um, and this is true in other places in the world too, in, Great, in the UK for instance, um, where their universal public health policies were basically uh, formulated and adopted during the war. Uh, the 1938 National General Mobilization Law uh, gave the government full control over labor and the ability to ration labor according to state needs. Um, it outlined a new economic order and the need to construct a national defense state, but ultimately it also w fell short a bit of its um, lofty goals, and no corporations uh, other than the electric power companies um, uh, here that I mentioned were indus or industries were nationalized, and the traditional managerial class uh, did stay in place. But uh, nevertheless, economic controls were, um, needless to say, put in place. In November 1938, there were profit ceilings placed on major corporations. In October 1939, the price control order and temporary wage measures uh, order placed caps on wages, prices, and rent. And in 1940, the government began rationing rice, sugar, and matches. Uh, McLean wrote, as with politics and society, the economy re remained partly free, partly controlled. Japan was also angry at the dollar sterling zones created in the pre-war, and it wanted to establish a new uh, yen zone in its empire, throughout its empire. So colonies would supply Japanese with goods and material resources, and as I mentioned, Japan tried its best to exploit China as well. And to varying degrees of success in China, uh, the amount of coal, for instance, produced in northern China and Mongolia increased from 10.7 million to 22.8 million tons between 1937 and 1941. There was also a big push to industrialize Korea and to mobilize Korean labor. Uh, Tojo tried more economic control, to gain more economic control over the indus over industries, uh, toward this end forming in 1941, the Iron and Steel Control Association, also other key industries and energy uh, sectors as well. But key industries were able to name their own bosses as the heads of these economic control planning agencies, so they did maintain con some control there, and in fact, began this began kind of tighter cooperation with the government. The control associations had some success in reversing the tide of key sector shortages due to embargoes, like from the U.S. Uh, in 1943, Tojo formed the Munitions Ministry to have more control over military production, and government actually increased wages in key sectors to attract people amidst labor shortages. Now, labor shortages was a major problem. Why are there labor shortages? Because, of course, uh, most working able-bodied men are being recruited uh, to fight as soldiers in the war. Um, so the mobilization law also allowed the government then to call up men to serve in key industries uh, and women as well for labor service. Ultimately 1.6 million men were recruited into industry by the end of the war. Um, the government was at first reluctant to recruit women since it wanted them to just basically stay at home and make lots of babies slash soldiers, uh, but eventually it had to reconsider this policy so that by February 1944, uh, 42, 42 42% of the workforce was female, women made up 60% of electrical communications and pharmaceutical companies, 40% of ordnance plants, uh, and 30% of aircraft production. The government also mobilized middle school students uh, into labor service from 1944, ultimately mobilizing uh, more than 3 million boys. And by August 1945, one-fifth of industrial work was done by boys under 25. 
Also in 1945, perhaps 50,000 POWs, 30,000 Chinese laborers, and, and 30,000 Chinese laborers in Japan, doing especially dangerous jobs like coal mining. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a government quota for mobilizing Korean workers, uh, but many of them were forcefully abducted just off the street. And between 1941 and 45, as many as 600,000 to 1 million Koreans were brought to Japan where they worked in mines, shipbuilding, and ammunition. In sum, in relation to the economy, the military budget throughout the 1930s and 40s wartime period uh, went up, general, but there were also general trade surpluses in the early years of the war, Japan uh, trading much more with uh, colonies under the Japanese Empire. Um, every day, um, <laughs> Everyday commodities by 1945, however, were only a fraction of their 1937 levels. So, um, uh, you know, daily goods and commodities for average people were, became much harder to get a hold of, and much national wealth was destroyed throughout the war. Um, property damage, factories, industries uh, destroyed in air raids, etc. But uh, while actual production indices dropped, production capacity itself went up. So all of this mobilized labor and government support for building up key industries was then laid in place during the wartime period. And this had important implications for the post-war recovery in Japan and subsequent economic boom. Also, other points of continuity with uh, wartime and post-war was, was that a system of subcontracting became popular. Financial institutions and large corporations became more closely linked. Labor unions were organized into enterprise-based unions. What this means is basically um, unions that are internal unions that operate within the company. They're company unions rather than outside unions. Uh, health insurance and pension were expanded for workers. And the status of tenant farmers was elevated while landowners uh, had their power decreased. So... Interesting points of continuity here, right? I mean, was the war all bad for the Japanese economy? Certainly not. Uh, I think that much we can quite easily conclude. Okay, and then moving on to then um, further conclusions uh, from this talk. So one thing that then, you know, is always uh, kind of in the backs of our mind then, I think, when we talk about the wars, well, why did these things happen? And I, I hope that through just detailing the progression of the war um, in Japan's foreign relations, political structure, uh, and economy at the time, some of these things might become apparent um, just by talking about the, the greater historical context. But if you have to narrow it down to some bullet points, um, it's a hard thing to do. And this list, I'll be honest, I mean, I, I'm constantly, you know, revising my thinking on this. And I, I just put this slide, this last slide together, you know, uh, this morning. So, um, so it's certainly not comprehensive. And my understanding on this is certainly not complete. But um, nevertheless, um, if I had to, to make an attempt at this point, um, I think you could divide it into three basic categories, societal, political, and material. And societal, this would mean just people basically lacking political freedoms and rights and political enfranchisement. People don't have an outlet to voice their concerns. They're not represented in politics. They're not encouraged to participate in politics. And this is um, a great obstacle to democratization. Um, alternative political views, left-wing, progressive, and Marxist views were suppressed throughout this period, as we looked at in a previous lecture on uh, the peace preservation law, for instance. Um, alternative views were not allowed. The only thing that was allowed was an emperor-centered Koktai ideology and hierarchy of racial superiority, which <laughs> um, outlined the basic following hierarchy of gods, emperor, Japanese subjects and colonial subjects. So you can see here how colonial subjects are placed uh, at the bottom of this hierarchy and how this supports ideas of racial superiority. 
Political would include the undemocratic nature of the Meiji constitution, which we looked at in the last lecture, the emperor and elite, which was emperor and elite centered, and where, wherein political parties had relatively little power. There was little to no room for political dissent, as evidenced by Minobe, Minobe Tatsukishi's removal from his position after voicing the organ theory of the state, which stated that the emperor was simply one organ of the state rather than uh, being above or transcending it, as well as the drive to counter Western hegemony um, and imperialism through adopting the same basic methods. And this was held by most, or if not all, mainstream politicians um, and elites at that time. And it was just a matter of degree to which degree they wanted to implement these things, but the, many of the basic goals they held in common. And then material would be things like the high levels of inequality and exploitation in Japanese society at the time, hierarchical and paternalistic company structures, which envisioned the company as an extension of the family state and carrying out ideas of filial piety between workers, management, and company owners, and imperial expansion for the purpose of exploiting colonial resources and labor. And I want to close with a quote from James McLean, which I think is very interesting when thinking about um, some of the causes and reasons for uh, the war, why Japan fought this war. And I, I don't know if McLean actually intended this to be um, kind of an, an assertion of, um, you know, his thinking on this. And, and it, it wasn't included in a in a summary or conclusion anywhere. It was just kind of pulled out of the middle of one of the, the sections of the middle of his textbook. But I, I really like this quote, and I think it's quite illuminating. It gives us a lot of food for thought, so I'll close with this. Japan had historical commonalities with Germany and Italy. All three countries began to develop capitalist economies at a relatively late date. In each, democracy enjoyed only a brief and uneasy ascendancy as it fought to put down roots even while those countries struggled to overcome severe economic crises. And all three feared that the British or Americans would stymie their aspirations for empire. So necessary, so necessary for economic self-sufficiency. <clears throat> Japan's historical trajectory, its quest for modernity, remained distinctly its own, distinctively its own. Unlike in Germany and Italy, the right wing in Japan never coalesced into a movement capable of overthrowing the established ruling elites. No single revolutionary party or mass organization seized the day, and no charismatic leader stood at the head of state. Throughout the 1930s, the Meiji Constitution remained viable and the same institutional structures and elite groups that had governed the country from 1890 continued to preside over uh, affairs of state. Okay, and that wraps up my lecture. Um, I'm going to try to close out of this. Here we go. And yeah, thank you very much for uh, listening. I hope this has... Uh, been able to shed some more light on the Asia-Pacific War, some of its reasons and causes, um, and to illuminate uh, a little about the, especially the political and economic structure of Japan at that time. And in our next lecture, we'll be looking at um, the occupation period and how um, the post-war Japanese uh, state was reconstructed and positioned uh, within uh, a profoundly restructured uh, world order uh, led by the United States. Thank you very much.